and that we discover something about ourselves too and give us the grace to change Please, God. Amen. Yes, Lord, help us. Amen. Amen. And that is true for us all. Good morning, everyone. We're going to start a new series today um, on the book of Jonah for the next four weeks. We're going to be... Now, last week, Erica inspired us with a talk entitled, I Am Enough, talking about Jesus. Today, I want to talk about I've Had Enough. Um, and uh, basically, but it's not just about me. No, it's... it's really about Jonah. Now, most of us are familiar with this story of Jonah that uh, we saw on the, uh, the cartoon a bit earlier that Jill was telling us, um, this story about this man who was swallowed by this great whale or, or great fish, and, and a lot of you might have been brought up in Sunday school and learnt it through a little song, you know, you can join in if you like, you know, listen to my tale of Jonah and the whale, way down in the middle of the ocean, how did he get there, whatever did he wear, way down in the middle of the ocean, a preaching he should be, in Nineveh you see, he disobeyed a very foolish notion, but God with his sin, salvation entered in, way down in the middle of the way down in the middle of the way down in the middle of the ocean. If you thought that was bad, if you thought that was bad, let's wait for the rest of the talk. Um, most of us are, are, are kind of familiar with this story, but maybe we miss the real message. It's a story that uh, I think, as, as uh, Roland's just prayed for us, it highlights God's character. But it also highlights the challenges that we have as human beings. Because God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts, as the Bible says. And this this story of Jonah. We we find a God who's all-knowing, who's all-powerful, and he's all over. He's everywhere. We're reminded, if you like, of words that Jonah must have known, a psalm, a song that David wrote, which you'll read in Psalm 139, which says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. See, Jonah was a prophet. That means he was a person who heard from God and he told others what God had said. He was a spokesman, if you like, for God. His name actually means messenger. So whether that was his real name or whether it was a nickname that people knew him by, he's God's messenger. He's the guy who can tell us what God's God's saying to us. He certainly, if you read 2 Kings uh, chapter 14, had real influence with the king. He was listened to in his day and age at the highest court, if you like. But he received a message he didn't like. Now, nowhere in this book does Jonah deny that God had spoken and said these words about going to Nineveh. It wasn't one of those things that you think, I think God might be speaking to me about this, but I'm not really sure. You know, I'll I'll put out a few fleeces and I'll I'll try a few things and and see what fits in. He He was actually convinced God had told him. He'd heard God plenty of times, but God had told him to go to Nineveh. But it was a message he didn't like. It challenged his views of what God should be like. Go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me, God said. Well, God wasn't the only one who's heard about Nineveh. Jonah had too. And as we heard in the story, Nineveh, which was the capital of the superpower of the day, Assyria, you know, the big power of its day, it was the biggest threat to Israel. Within 50 years, Israel was destroyed by Assyria. It was known for its cruelty and atrocities. You know, they used to drag prisoners with with, um, hooks in their mouths in through the streets of Nineveh, parading emperors and kings that they destroyed. They were a really nasty bunch of people. Atrocities. And in, in, you know, Jonah's mind, what he'd heard about Nineveh was all bad. They didn't deserve mercy. They deserved judgment. Naaman the prophet, another book that you'll read in the Old Testament, described Nineveh as the city of blood. Gives you an idea what this place is like. 
And Jonah's response was that he didn't really fancy a short-term overseas mission trip to Nineveh. God had said go, and Jonah said definitely no. God said go east, and Jonah determinedly went west as far as any ship from his in those days, Tarshish on the coast of, of Spain, right the way across the Mediterranean. As far as he could get away, if you like, from the, the, the people of God, from the, the promised land that God had given him, from, from his ministry, from everything. He, he, just, he just went. He was getting out of there. He set out for a hideout, if you like, in Spain, a bit like, you know, those bank robbers in the 1970s used to go, you know. Fancied a life on the Costa Brava, you know, for the rest of his life. He took a cruise rather than a mission, if you like. And it cost him big time. He had to pay for it. It, it, it cost him real money to do this, to walk away from God. He set off in a long disobedience in the wrong direction. Do you know, some of our choices that we all make at times take us a long way from God. But it's never the end of the story for us. And it wasn't the end of the story for Jonah. Now, why did he run? Was he scared? Well, I know I would have been. Was it because he thought, well, I don't know the language and I'll have real problems finding an interpreter uh, to actually get my message across? Well, no. Because as you'll discover in this story, and you probably already know, he does eventually go there and he does eventually preach. The problem was that Jonah didn't agree with God's plan. And he'd already made that clear. Now you find this hidden in the middle of the book. It's, it, it's right in the, the end of chapter 3 and the start of chapter 4. And it's the, it's the central point of this whole book where Jonah does go and the Ninevans kind of repent and say, oh gosh, we need to change our ways. We, we've messed up. We need, we need forgiveness. And God starts to show compassion on them rather than judgment. And Jonah comes up with this fantastic prayer to God. And he says this in, in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Oh Lord, isn't this just what I said would happen while I was still at home? Before, that's why I was so quick to flee to Spain or to Tarshish. I knew you were gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents to send calamity. He said, I knew this would happen. I knew, it. I knew if I went there, they'd repent. They'd turn to God. These nasty, nasty people who deserve judgment and the fire of God to be thrown on them. You know, God's actually, you're going to forgive them? God had been true to his character and he'd shown compassion on Nineveh. And jo Jonah, as you read in 4, four verse 1, is angry and displeased that God is being God. It made me think about my opinion of ISIS or the Taliban at the moment. And my prayers. Jonah didn't like the Ninevites. They deserved judgment. They were undeserving of God's grace and mercy. They were different. They worshipped other gods. They were cruel. They were the enemy. And Jonah was convinced he knew better than God. These Ninevites didn't deserve the opportunity for salvation. Basically, Jonah was a nationalist and he was prejudiced. Ladies and gentlemen, prejudice colours our opinion of people and of nations. And it also causes us to jump to conclusions that perhaps God doesn't ask us to do. Yes, the Ninevites were sinners. Yes, they weren't one of us. They were a different nation altogether. And, and you know, you can understand, Jonah said, I'm not going to waste my time going all that way, all those hundreds of miles for that lot. But there's a great contrast here between God's people, or God's spokesman in this case, Jonah, and God's character towards this nation. Whereas God saw the mess of Nineveh and wanted to speak into that mess and give them an opportunity to turn to him, Jonah wanted none of it. He didn't want to show grace and mercy at all or compassion. He wanted judgment. Jonah's understanding of God was limited by his own prejudice and nationalism. I tell you, these are big issues in the world we live in today. You just think about the last 15 months in our world. Think about our own nation. Whatever you think about the Black Lives 
the movement. Whatever you think about what's been happening in rights in, in our whatever you think about footballers taking the knee, whatever you think about the rise of nationalism in England, in Scotland, in Russia, in China, around the world, this separates people. It, say, it says we are superior, we are different, we are better, we want to keep ourselves apart from others. Nationalism is a sin. Cheer up. <laughs> We are called to be one people, one holy nation, a people belonging to God from all nations, from every tribe and dialect. We are not a superior people. We are not Great Britain in some spiritual superiority. We are a people needing God's mercy and grace because we are a people under judgment, just as the Taliban are under judgment. And until we realize that, that we're all sinners who need the grace of God in our lives, we are not going to actually confront the issues of prejudice and nationalism that get in the way of the message of the gospel of grace going out around the world in these days. Say amen or say ouch. Because <laughs> if our world is too small for others who are not like us, then it is too small. Jonah's prejudice affected his faith and it affected his faithfulness to God. He's willing. Imagine this. Here's a man speaking to the king who's actually facing the nation with the word of God in Israel. And he's willing to give it all up because he's afraid that God will lead to repentance the Assyrians. Think about it. He's willing to give up his, his, his position in the country. He's willing to give up his ministry, to give up his home, to give up everything and get on a boat and and, you know, go to the farthermost parts of the sea. Even if I go out there, God says, oh, I'm with you. He's gone away. This is what he's saying is, I really want to worship a God who agrees with my view of the world. You know, this it challenges my world view. And you know, there's a many people who, who, who talk about Christianity and say, well, you know, you know, I believe in God, but I don't believe in what the church says because it doesn't actually fit in with my worldview. And they walk away from it. We don't get the choice. <laughs> God is God. It was a big choice. Say no to God takes you away from him. Or does it? Where can I flee from your presence? As someone wrote that I read this week, Jonah tested God's patience, but more importantly, he tested his presence. Because <laughs> in verse 3 and verse 10 of chapter 1, you'll read that Jonah was running away from God's presence. Twice it's said. He's running away from the presence of God was to learn what we all need to learn, that it is impossible to get away from God. You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> you cannot escape God. Where can I go from your presence, David said? I can't get away from you. And throughout this story, God is all over it. He's always there. And actually, he's always in control. And that is a challenge to us when we look at the world and look at things that are happening in the world. And, and the Assyrian superpower continued to grow after this story. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to why does God allow this to happen? Why, why are these things happening? But in the, in the midst of all this, and I don't have answers for those big questions, and I'm not even going to try to pretend to give you them. God is in control. So Jonah sets off. And God says, I've got him. I've got him. He doesn't need a sat nav or a He knows where you are. And basically, um, what happens is, Jonah's, you know, he's kind of upset that God isn't going to judge. He doesn't think. But God does judge. God judges Jonah. <laughs> this is the interesting thing, isn't it? The storm is stormy about what Jonah is doing, if you like. Um, and the 
Now, here he is wanting judgment on Nineveh, but the Bible tells us that judgment begins with God's people. God actually tests and tries and proves us first. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be the people who actually don't just pay lip service to him, but walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And um, God is on his case, and he's not going to make things easy for Jonah getting away. There's all these seasoned sailors on this ship, but the storm was epic. It was so bad that they were frightened to death. And they were praying for their lives. I don't even know if they were religious people. But we read that they, each of them were praying to their own gods. So the inference here is this crew are not Jews. They're not people of God. They're, from, they're Gentiles. They're from other nations. We don't know how many of them. But there's lots of different gods. Pray to their own God. They would be sailors from different nations who are working on this boat. Everything they could to survive. Chucking out, out, out the freight they were taking to Spain, you know, because it would be, a, it would be a, a, about commercial things, you know, bringing stuff from Spain back to Israel, take stuff from Israel over to Spain. And Jonah, in the midst of it, is fast asleep, we read. He's totally oblivious of the chaos his actions were having on others. Can I say, running away from God doesn't just have consequences for ourselves. It has consequences for others too. And particularly those close to us, like the sailors that day. The captain wakes Jonah up, doesn't he? And says, call on your God, verse 6. So, now the last thing Jonah wanted to do was pray. When you are convicted, when you're doing stuff that actually God, you know, asking you to do, when you know you're doing something bad, you really don't want to pray about it. <laughs> the last thing you want to do is talk to God because you just know what the answer is going to be, don't you? Um, you know what God's going to bring up. You know, I'd like to talk to you about the storm, God. God said, well, actually, there's something else I'd like to talk to you about. And, and, no, but I need to, my, my needs now, my, my felt needs, I need to be out of the storm. Well, actually, you know, there's a bigger issue here, mate. The bigger issue is what you're doing with your life. How you're living, where you're going, what you're doing with yourself. But Jonah determined his course. He didn't really want to know what God thought about it. The sailors are so desperate, they get to that point where it's almost spuds out, we say in Yorkshire, you know. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. Who's, who's, who's the problem here? And of course, we read that the lot fell on Jonah. Well, it was. It was coming on his head big time. Okay, what's going on, they say. And Jonah actually fesses up. He confesses. He, he says two remarkable things. Listen to this, because this is so true of us, and I'm including me in this. He says, firstly, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of, who made heaven and the sea. Jonah is saying, in the midst of this storm that was his fault, oh, but I worship God. I believe in God. I'm a follower of God. I'm one of God's people. You know, but my life's actually nowhere near it. It's like he's paying service to his faith. Oh, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. But his life's going completely the opposite direction to where God wants him. We've all been there at times, I think. And then he says, he confesses also, I'm running from God. And this is all really down to my disobedience. God is judging. So please throw me overboard and you'll be saved. Now, if you doubted that Jonah hadn't gone, to, well, you think, actually, Jonah must have not gone to Nineveh because he was frightened. This is actually the actions of a brave man. He's saying, sacrifice my life and you'll be saved. I will die for you. And who he was dying for here is quite interesting. He wasn't dying for his own people. He was dying for a bunch of Gentiles in the middle of the sea. He was willing to do that. And um, <laughs> something that he wasn't prepared to offer to Nineveh, he was quite willing to offer some sort of, some sort of salvation, sacrifice his life for the sake of these sailors. Um, were reluctant to overboard. They had more compassion on Jonah in his mess than Jonah ever had on Nineveh. You know, non-Christians showing more concern than the church. There's another challenge. You know, it's quite an interesting one. Um, of course, they start to pray to God. And they start to ask for forgiveness. But they eventually did what, God, what Jonah told them to do. He said, Lord, please forgive us. This is an innocent man. Uh, we're just doing what, we, what he tells us to do. We really not want him to die. They prayed, if you like, 
for their salvation and, and about the situation. Now the Bible tells us in Psalm 145 that the Lord is near to everyone who calls on him. Everyone. Psalm 145. I think that's really quite good. <laughs> the dying thief. The undeserving. The people who have not have messed up in life. God is near to everyone who calls on him. And, um, and the storm, as we heard in the story, immediately ceased. And the miracle of that calming of the storm that we read about in Jonah led to the salvation of these Gentile sailors. We don't, realize, we don't hear that they become Jews. It's quite interesting, you know. But they God in the middle of the sea in a way that has changed their lives. But this wasn't the end for Jonah, as we've heard. God provided this great fish, which was his salvation from a watery grave. So God is present both in the judgment of Jonah and in his salvation. And in this book, we're going to read about God's remarkable mercy that extended not just to Jonah, but also to sailors who didn't know anything about God, to Ninevites. And it's a lesson, obviously, that Jonah had to learn about God's grace. So in conclusion, what can we learn from this chapter and what will we learn from this book? Firstly, one, to challenge to our human understanding, we are so clever, aren't we? We think we know it, but God knows best. He is all-knowing. He's the real know-it-all. If you want a technical or a theological term, he is omniscient. We might choose to disagree with God's word, we might not understand everything that he asks of us. But the Bible makes it clear that his ways at times are our ways. His ways are past our human understanding. But God ultimately knows best. And it's not for us to decide who God would have mercy on. Because God's love and concern extends to people and places that our love and concern do not. Secondly, we learn that God is all-powerful, that God is in control. Technical, theological word, omnipotent. Here he's controlling the winds and the waves. He's controlling the drawing of lots. He's controlling a great fish in the sea. There's nothing chance about this story. It's not random luck that the lot falls on Jonah. It's not random luck that a big fish is, is going past in the Mediterranean. There's nothing random about the storm. It's all controlled by a powerful God who is control over nature and over history, if you like. He controls. His power is supreme. He rules and reigns. Not us, not our enemies or who we perceive to be our enemies, the Ninevites. God uses circumstances to get our attention and bend our wills to his. Some of them we don't like. Some of them are difficult and painful. But God can use all circumstances as we're open to him to, to bend and to break our wills to his. And finally, God is all over. He's all over this story. He's everywhere. We think we can run away, but we can never get away from God. We can't hide. You can't outrun God. You're never beyond his sight or his reach. There's nothing hidden from him. Nothing escapes him. Now you might be like Jonah today. You might be like Jonah in the boat, calling yourself a believer, a worshipper. The Bible describes a, a people who draw near to God with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. You know, where actually say, oh, well, I worship God but actually I'm going in the wrong direction with my life. God challenges us. He says, you call yourself a believer, you call yourself a worshipper, follow me, not your own way, not your own determined path, not your own decisions, not your own view of who I should be and what I should do, follow me. And we're called to follow, aren't we? Maybe 
today you know that you're running away from God. Maybe you've chosen some route of disobedience. I want to give you some good news too. God not only sees that, but God is there. He's everywhere. (laughs) God meets us in our flaws, in our flawed thinking, in our flawed actions, in our failures, in our mess. Just as he met Ninevites, just as he met sailors. You realize if there hadn't been a storm that day, those sailors would never have come to faith. (laughs) Um, You know, just as he met Jonah, God can meet us in the depths, in the storms, in the challenges of life. If we will be open to God meeting us in those difficult places, it will challenge our choices. He will make a way for us, but he will, he will speak to us if we're willing to listen to him about how we're living and what we're doing with our lives. He'll make that way to come back to him. And as we see in this story, this brilliant story, as we heard, <laughs> this is not the end, chapter 1. It's only the beginning of a, a work of grace in Jonah's life that led to a work of grace in others' life. And it was a long road back for Jonah, you'll see. He still had lessons to learn, but God was with him through it all. Amen. God bless. Well, I'll pray if you like. Okay, let's pray.